So glad that you've joined us this morning to worship. Uh, today, uh, Richard Starry, one of our deacons, will be preaching this morning in Pastor Sam's absence. That's a new song we were just singing. It's called Jesus Firm Foundation. We're going to ask you to stand with us. We're just going to sing the chorus of that with you this morning, teach that to you, and then we're going to roll right on into Days of Elijah before uh, Richard brings the morning announcements. So let's see if we can get the slides in. How firm? You got this? Come in. There we go. Shining like the sun, I had. 
jubilee and out of Zion's hillside behold he comes behold he comes riding on the cloud put your hands together a shining like the sun I had a trumpet call so lift your voice it's the year of jubilee and out of Zion's hillside let's drop it down a little there's no God like Jehovah there's no God like Jehovah. 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 There's no sing that again. There's no God. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like one more time. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. Behold, He comes, a riding on the clouds, a shining like the sun. I had a trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation. One more time. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. I had a trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Thank you. You may be seated. Brother Richard's going to come up bring the morning announcements for us. Good morning. Um, just to expand a little bit on FBI, Faith Bible Institute, for those who don't know the abbreviation, it is starting this, not, let's see, what is today's date? Not this Thursday, but a week from this Thursday, sorry. At 5.30, it's usually a three-hour long class. We go over Old Testament, New Testament, and theology. It's a three-year course. Um, but it's taught all over the world, so even if you're not going to be here for the full three years to get all six semesters, most likely wherever you go next, they'll have a class so you can continue on with them. Um, if you're interested in just finding out what it is, please come. We'll have some food. You can just check it out, see if you're interested in joining. Also, um, there's a new women's evening Bible study that I'm going to be leading. It's going to be on Tuesday nights from 5.30 to 7.30. It's going to be a Bethmore Bible study on Daniel. I want to get the books ordered this week, so if any of you are interested, just let me know, and I'll get a book ordered for you, and you can just pay me later. So I think that's it. Anything I, I missed, Linda? Okay, thanks. All right, looks like Richard's done. Any, any other announcements for this morning? Pastor will be back in just a few weeks. Uh, we're going to ask you at this time to go ahead and stand up and welcome one another in the Lord this morning. And uh, keep this in mind as you do that. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another this morning.
sing this with us as you return to your seats. Oh, victory. Oh, victory.
this time to collect the morning offering. Just remain standing with us. Question of a New Life is the title of my, uh, I think I got two echoes here. <clears throat> Question of a New Life. I personally am one of those, oh yes, the Children's Church are released uh, from ages three to kindergarten, three through kindergarten. I think I got a little echo, do you hear it? Okay. It's always fun watching them get excited when they do the hand motions up here and they're all trying to dance and do it. You know, they see them do the flute and they're just like this. 
Uh, very entertaining. I enjoy it. I guess as they say, you know, I'm a Toys R Us kid. I don't want to grow up. I still see those things. I enjoy them. Um, the question of a new life. I'm kind of the person that uh, I like people to ask me the hard, the hard questions because it really challenges me to have the right answer. The Bible says, be ready always to give an answer to every man that ha asks, us, asks you of a reason of the hope that's in you. I think the Bible, personally, is literal, is true, accurate, is absolute. I believe that it can be trusted. It's not just some uh, fairy tale book. It's not a, just a belief because I want to believe it, because it makes me feel good, because I have this cushion that when I die, I go to heaven. In fact, I think it's the opposite. The evolutionist has only nothing. He has no consequence for any sin he does. I think that's the biggest crutch you can have. I think uh, the hardest weight you can bear is to know that the Bible says that any man who sins, his end is in hell. You know, the Bible says without repentance, we shall end there. So I think the Bible, unlike any other book in the world, is the most accurate. Looking at history, looking at science, looking at all those things, I love it. And one of the things I... I question myself and I question others and I have others ask me the questions or I, I, uh, I try to get them to ask those questions sometimes, the hard questions. Is it true what the Bible says? Because it gives a lot of promises. The Word of God says a lot of bold statements, very bold statements. Either it's true or it's a lie. You know, we have a lot of pretty words today. We, you know, we call them kleptos instead of thieves. We call them, you know, habitual this or habitual that rather than what they actually are. Well, the Bible has labels for things, and it labels them very blatantly. Uh, the Bible says it's either true or it's a lie in many things. Either we tell the truth or we tell a lie. The Bible says Jesus did all those things which please the Father, and the Bible says he cannot lie. The Father cannot lie, and neither does Christ. He said many things in the Scripture. We go to the first, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's the question. Is this true? Are things new to us as Christians? You know, many of us call ourselves Christians. The Bible has many, many rebukes to those who call themselves Christians. In fact, the uh, parable of the sower and the seed directly deals with those things. How some call themselves Christian. They come up for joy and on. They appear to be Christian. They think they are. They they, they show some things that look like they're probably Christian, but in the end, when trials and tribulations and persecutions come, they show that it's not. So here is something we need to ask ourselves. Is it true in us? When we get saved, if we claim to be Christian, did something truly change? Did everything truly change for us? Did our worldview and everything according to that worldview change in us? Is there truly a change and everything new become, everything becomes new to us? That's a question we really need to ask. All things new. What does it mean? Is this just a figure of speech or something? Truly question ourselves. As one who calls himself a Christian, have you truly asked yourself if all these things have become new in your life? And what are these things? Is there really something new or different after you got saved? Because that's a pretty bold statement, wouldn't you agree? All things become new. Old things pass away. It's a very bold statement. Absolutely, from my perspective, I believe the Bible is true. I believe the Word of God is not just true in some abstract or unknowable form, but rather it is arguably the most solidly knowable truth that any man can ever discover on this side of death. It's not just a message or a good analogy or a parable, but is literally life that can be lived word for word obeyed work for work, and followed thought for thought. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on these things. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. And I ask that you forgive me of my sins, for they are many. Every day I get up and I, I ruin the day, but you are gracious and merciful to me. You have patience with me, and you teach me every day. You humble me. Lord, I pray that my words will be honoring to you, and it will guide men to you, and it will have men challenge themselves in their own minds, in their own thoughts, their own hearts, to see whether they are of the faith, to see if they live after you, to see if they love you, so that they can have that day when they meet you in paradise.
and not meet you on the day of judgment for their sins. For I know that you paid our sin debt for us, Lord. And I thank you for this, and I thank you for this mercy and this great grace that you have given to us. And I ask, Lord, that you bless these things in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at the answers God has given us to these questions. You can see, because I believe God has the answers in his word. Let's go to the next slide. God doesn't just give you some analogy. When you come to church, I hope and pray that most churches you go to, that when you leave, you don't go, well, how do I do anything about that? It was a nice message, made me feel good for five minutes, but I have no clue how to apply that to my life. I, I despise that. I hope that when you leave this day, that my message is something that works in your mind. Even the apostle said, I had rather speak five words of understanding than in every other tongue so that the mind be fruitful, that the body and the actions and everything that follows through with what we think can be lived out, literally, so we can have an understanding. It's not just some feel-good or feel-bad message. We have plenty of things out there that are false. We've got lots of TV shows, right? We're going to entertain ourselves all day long. I don't, need, I don't want an entertainment here for you. I want to challenge you to think. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. That's it, Lord. He requires us to think. Think with each other to challenge one another. And this is one of the things that we should challenge ourselves on. Psalms 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does... Shall not uh, shall prosper. You see here it says his delight is what. It says, uh, if, if all things are new, then one thing new to us will be the delight in his law or the Ten Commandments. It's kind of an odd odd thing to think about, but the Bible says it. His delight will be in the law of the Lord. Because you see, the Ten Commandments they are what was necessary to set us free. It is the only. It is only when. One looks into the mirror of absolute perfection, which is Christ, which is the Ten Commandments, his, his absolute standard of perfection, that we see that only Christ is perfect. We are in need of him for his payment for our sins. We love it because, as Scripture says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. This is why we love it, because, you see, when we realize who we are, we get broken down, humbled, the Bible says. The Bible says, better to be broken on the rock, which is Jesus Christ, rather than crushed by it in the day of judgment. You see, humility is a breaking act. Whenever we go to work and somebody says something to us, you need to fix this because this is wrong. Or we go to a friend and they say, you're totally wrong. How many, how many of us love that? You know, I never once loved it. I, I still don't love it today. It's, it's one of the hardest things to take. It's a correction. Especially, it's hard when it comes from a hypocrite, right? But you know what? The truth is, humility will take it from anyone. When we humble ourselves, we'll take correction and, and instruction and rebuke from anyone. It'll be hard still, nonetheless. But humility is what it seeks here. So you see, the, the Ten Commandments shows us the truth. He didn't give the law because we needed to know it. He gave the law because he's declaring to us we've already broke it. Who here hasn't lied? Who hasn't stolen? Think about it. We're all guilty of it. These are the things that set us free because we stopped giving excuses for our life. Instead, we started giving answers to the Lord, saying, Lord, what must I do? This is when we became a Christian, we realized the law says we are guilty, and we had our lives transformed by Christ. So we see a new love for the law, a new love for his commands. It is also says here that the leaf shall not wither. And what does he prosper? And what, is, and what does he prosper? Uh, it's either the truth or it's a lie. What is the leaf or what is the life of the leaf? Think about this. Why not ask Job? When he lost everything, when everything was lost to him, where did he turn and whom did he seek after? You see, he sought after the root of his life and he did not wither. The root was Christ. He knew that after all that he lost, his family, his lands, everything, his servants, his money, all of it, he knew he went back to the root. God gave and God took. Blessed is that God that I serve. Blessed is he whom I serve. You see, his strength was in the root, not in himself. Because if any man suffered that kind of loss, it would be done. 
But his strength was in, his, in the root, which was God, because he knew where his children were. He knew where all that was of value was, what's in God, because he has in control of everything. So you'll see this strength in us. Nothing challenges that. There are things that make us doubt whether or not what we say is true, maybe challenges our specific idea of a certain point of faith, but it cannot change the fact that we know then and realize that Christ is our life, that literally without him we are dead in trespasses and sin. When we see the world, we see it created. We see that all things were made by a creator. It's intelligently designed. It did not pop up from some universal explosion, you know, 5.6 trillion years ago. It's not magically made by some magical process that we never see in a laboratory anywhere. It was made by an intelligent designer, and we know this. We're going to have to give an answer. You see, these things change in us because before, our hope was shaky. Our hope was only ifs, ands, or buts. It was wishes and hopes and dreams. It was built on what my father and mother had told me before, maybe the Santa Claus-type ideas. You know, it doesn't mean anything. But when we become a Christian, these things change. There's a solidness to our foundation that cannot be shaken, no matter what the trials that come. <clears throat> what is it to prosper in all things? Why not ask Joseph, who was thrown into the pit, sold into slavery, tossed into jail, yet redeemed through all of his trials, for he counted prosperity through the measure of obedience to Christ. His measure was, I will serve him, and how well am I serving him? That was his prosperity, because Think about what Joseph prospered in. Everywhere he went that he was thrown in to suffer, he prospered. And God prospered him even the more in the end. Why? Because he counted the one thing that was true. He counted God as his prosperity. In slavery he bore fruit. In prison he bore fruit. And in the Lord he bore all things much more fruit. Yet much of his life was not what most would call today or consider prospering. Since the word is synonymous today with money or greed. Oh, we're prospering. We're thinking about money or some other thing, right? It's like profit. We think of money or only those things. But in reality, in truth, he prospered greatly in the Lord. These promises are for God. These promises are, sorry, are from God. And, we, and he makes them plain to see. Job and Joseph knew the newness of life in well, for they could seek no other in even the worst of times. Romans 7, 5, and 6. Next verse, please. For when we were in, in the flesh, the passions of sin, which were by the law, worked in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We see a contrast of the old man that once drove us in the passions of our sin. You see, this was the old nature. As a Christian, we will see a contrast. It's a real question. If you don't see a contrast, it's something you should consider heavily. Because we should see this contrast of the old man. We lusted without concern, as, all, as we always desired more without regret. But the new man weeps because of the desires of the old man who is still in there warring within us. Now we are humbled by our sin, and our conscience is pricked because of our passions we chased after them without hesitation. Now we serve, we now serve a new master, and our heart has a new call. And that call is the Spirit of Christ hungering after righteousness. You see, a serious contrast here. When we were not saved, our lives we sought after others' pleasure, others, others' sights, what, what others saw us as. Uh, we have to impress this person. I have to look good in front of this person. I have to do these things. But when we got saved, we despised those things. And we begin to change in us. We begin to humble ourselves. We begin to see that old man, that desire to be known and seen, it angers us. It makes us weep because of our old nature. We see the corruptness of it. We begin to look in that mirror every day. We begin to see things that need to change. You see, it's a continual process. And this is something we should see clearly, because there is evidence. John 15, 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth fruit, not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, 
he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, my words abide in ye. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. You see, if all things are new, then we will see and feel the pruning of the old. Remember that correction and the humbling, the rebuking? It's going to not always feel good to get rid of something. Sometimes it'll feel good, sometimes it won't. I remember when I first got saved, I wanted to clear out my house. And my overzealous uh, friend, a young Christian himself, uh, very bold, house and let's start throwing things away. He came in, took my entire uh, liquor cabinet, and just poured it out in the sink right in front of me. He took my, he took my DVD, he didn't even care what it was. If I called it Christian, he didn't even care if it was semi-Christian. He's like, we're going to start from the beginning. He shattered everything. He was excited. And I was, I was too at the time. I, I was like, okay, let's do it, anything. It doesn't matter what it is because there was a passion in me to clean up. There was a passion in me that uh, still today is a little more mature. I don't just waste things just because, but I have a balance. I've learned to be a little more mature, maybe not all that way mature, but I've a little more mature, right? But at the same right, there's a passion that changes in us. It's a passion for righteousness. It's a passion to please him. Something new in us that was never there before. I always felt guilty most of the times. I always felt something wasn't right, but I didn't want to deal with it because I enjoyed my life as it was. I went after my pleasures, life's pleasures. See, there's a new pruning, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it hurts. We will drop old desires as we find them in the way after, uh, of our following after Christ. Things will not change superficially, but to the contrary, they will change internally and willingly and will be seen outwardly as a result. In fact, many times others will see before you see the change going on in you. Pruning and purging are rarely painless and without cost, and we will do them willingly and joyfully. His word also says here, they will bring forth much fruit. Not might or maybe, but this fruit will be according to the root of the tree. Because remember, our life is in the root of the tree. That root is Christ. Which Christ, he came for one purpose, to redeem us. Our fruit will be after this kind. It will seek to win the lost and will work to strengthen its own. Just transform sunlight energy to feed the tree as a whole. You see, our desires, it doesn't matter whether, uh, like Willie and uh, like Brother Ike, love music. Their desire will be pleasing unto the Lord, but they will still speak unto men to seek to see them saved. All of us as Christians, there should be a change in us. So much so that when we meet a man or a woman on the street or a young child or a young uh, person, we go, where is this person's eternity? It's in the back of our minds. It affects us every day. How do I speak to this individual? How do I love them? How do I show them the truth? Is there a way that I can talk to them even today or even now? Be it professional or otherwise. Think about it. As a military member, we have certain, those of you that are military, not just the, uh, the spouse, those that get in that military profession, we know there's a change that has to happen. When I talk to certain people, an officer, and I'm an enlisted, I have a certain manner of talking to them. The same with those under me or over me in rank. There's a certain way of talking to them. But you know that there's a... There's an ability to bridge a gap in between those things. And if we love their soul and we love them and Christ loves us, we're going to find a way to bridge that gap, even if the barrier is there. We're going to find a way because we care, because it's life. Think about this. Why are we in the military, most of us? Defend freedom, right? Because ultimately it comes down to one thing. We are defending life. That's the only reason most of us join is in the, in the background is I'm going to defend my country for what's right. Every country the same. They join to do those things which they feel are right to save life. How much more is that life worth that's right next to you, that's defending another life, and yet at the end he may die? How much more valuable is that? 
Think about it. Not just some miscellaneous th random thought of I'm going to serve in the military. But this person right next to me, his life is of value, and I'm going to fight to defend it. I'm going to fight for it. You see, these things change in us. <clears throat> you see here also, he says in the end, for this, he says, this you shall be my disciples. This is the proof. This is part of our proof, you see. This is, the non, this is not some unseeable truism made up to persuade men of their own self-righteousness. This is something he says very much. So shall you be my disciples. This is an evidence that comes out of a heart that's transformed. This is something we will desire and things that we will move forward in. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, and they are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, quarreling, rivalry, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and such the like. The Bible has much to say about all our sins, and all of them fall under those Ten Commandments. About these things, I tell you again, as I have also told you in times past, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, this was our life. This was our life. We fall under one of the Ten Commandments. Throughout the day, we fall under all of them. We, we, we violate them left and right. We make people believe the wrong thing, obvi obviously, because we don't want to take the responsibility of telling them the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me the Lord, right? We don't want to do that, because sometimes it, it costs us, right? So... We see here, this is the old life. This is the contrast. This was our desires naturally. We're going to do whatever keeps me in the limelight and keeps me out of the negative light. Whatever gets me what I want in the end, whether it be Chief Mass Sergeant in the Air Force or, you know, uh, General so-and-so or whether it be, you know, the President himself, whatever my goal is. This makes us understand those were our goals, and they were selfish. They were self-fulfilling. They weren't concerned with others. But when we get saved... They begin to change. We begin to challenge those things. The old flesh is still there. We have to war against it. But we begin to challenge those things. Things change. Here we see another answer. This defines our old life. And these were our old works, regular on a basis. On a regular basis, sorry. The but they continually does the opposite of these now. Our new life will be defined contrary to these. And others will see this. Even scripture said, such were some of you in times past. Our works will change, and our desires and thoughts as well. Others will see this. They'll be like, hey, man, why aren't you going with me to this? I, I just don't want to do that, man. I don't want to do that anymore. Happens many times. I remember uh, several young men that got saved. Never once sat down and said, hey, man, you need to stop going to the bars and stop looking for women like that. You know, you need to have respect for women or this. I didn't tell them any of those things. They'd be like, man, I, I can't go to that man anymore. I was like, that's his own conscience. He already had that conscience beforehand. Now it's just become amplified, and now it's become... Holy Spirit backed completely and internally. Things change. Some things need to change, right? We all have things that need to change. But some things change really quick. And other things take time because they begin to see them. We begin to weed them out. In Galatians 5, through 23, we see the opposite the contrast uh, to the last. But the fruit of the Spirit, here, get this, the fruit singular, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, Faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law, and, who, though, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. So here's two parts. We're going to have the Spirit. We're going to have the, the fruit of the Spirit being entered into us, and we're going to have to work on that fruit. It's going to have to work. We're going to have to work it. We're going to have to change it. Because some things are just, you ever made those stubborn old crotchety people, you know, just I'm not going to change, you know. Well, God, God's going to change. But. And some of them things, Lord, I'm just going to have to give this to you because I really want to tell this person something else, right? Some things are going to have to change. Some, some of our attitudes are going to have to change. But there's a desire that adds in brand new that wasn't there before. I want to change. And so there's going to be a, a natural want for those things, to do those things naturally. <clears throat> One fruit. You see, this proof is very, very obvious. It will begin to show itself in all that we say and think and do. Because it says here, walk in the Spirit. 
It's a command. So not only is things changing in us, it says do it. Because we're going to still have that old man. Someone's going to rub us wrong, and we're going to want to get excited, right? Get mad, get angry, get whatever. But we're going to have to humble ourselves and say, Lord, help me talk to this person. (laughs) Because I don't want to talk to them. I want to use my hands, right? Think about it. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Here we see another proof. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. It's kind of one of those statements we kind of read generically. Oh, God is love. I mean, heard the hippies back in the old days, you know. Oh, God is love. Right? People still say it, right? But they don't understand the concept of what that love means. Because he is, he is love. And those that love him will begin to have that love manifest in themselves, the love for their neighbor, the love for their enemy. They will begin to weep for them. Another new change will be your love for others. It will change from the old and hollow love we once had to new, uh, uh, that we all knew, to a genuine passion for the lost, for your enemies, and for all those around you. Your heart will begin to work over the lost and dying. It will begin to break and weep. You'll feel the change in the deepest uh, of all these other changes, and you'll know it, uh, and you'll know that it wasn't natural because it's, it's the deepest part of us. The love we once had as the love we will have is a drastic change. I can tell you that for certain in my own experience, in my wife's own experience. Things we would let pass that we will no longer let pass, things that we will put aside and not consider because they are offensive to us or our friends, we will consider because it's absolutely important. Matthew 7, 17 through 20. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, and the corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not fruit, good, uh, forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits they shall be known. God compares us to that tree again. You see, others will see a change in you. And the flip side, others will see that there is no change in you, that you're just like everyone else if you're not. You see, they'll see the truth. They don't need to be lied to. They don't need to be any of those things they see. It's kind of like when you meet a man, you shake his hand. He says, hey, how's it going? And you know he has no concern for you whatsoever. Just everything about him. You know, we see these things because the leaf and the tree and the branch bears fruit. What fruit is it bearing? You're going to see it very plainly. You're going to see your own fruit, but not as easy as other other people are going to see your fruit. You see, we bear fruit of the root. And if our root is evil, how evil is that fruit? One proof is the other, is for others to see. They will see the new fruit that we may not even see in ourselves. Luke 6, 43 through 45, here again. For a good tree bringeth, forth, uh, bringeth not forth uh, corrupt fruit. Uh, for, I'm sorry, a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit. Neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit, for every tree is known of its fruit. For, the, for from thorns men do not gather figs, nor from bramble bushes gather they grapes. A good man out of a good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. And hear this. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. The abundance of the heart. Every tree is known of its own fruit. Out of the heart the treasure be good or bad is what comes out. We're going to see it because it's going to come out in their works. And guess what? In the last thing, out of their speech. Out of the abundance of their heart the mouth speaks. Is that true or not? Think about it. When someone loves a certain thing, has a passion for things, be it motorcycles or otherwise, what is the one thing they're talking about all day long? Motorcycles. I have a friend, you know, back at work, you know. He was QA. I don't know if you all know what that was. It's quality assurance. He'd come and he want, I want to inspect you, right? If you know you're going to do really bad, just ask him about motorcycles. You're going to pass 100% because he's not going to have a clue what you just did. Oh, motorcycles. Oh, man, I'm going to get on this, right? Because his passion was motorcycles. Where is your passion, and has it changed? It's not going to lose those things we enjoy in the physical flesh because we can gain other Christians through anything that God has given us that we enjoy. 
However, a new passion will be added. And that will be for the lost. If we see that transformation, it is another thing that we see that God has made new to us. Very interesting. C.S. Lewis talked about uh, in the beginning. Um, I said, I give the intro to C.S. Lewis a quote. I said, uh, the more we let God take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. Because he made us, he invented us, he invented us all the different people that you and I were intended to be. It is when I turn to Christ, when I give up my to his personality, that I begin to have a real personality of my own. See, and when, when he's talking about this personality, this is who we are. Is, this is how we characterize who we are. How do others characterize you? Do others honestly think of you as one of the Christians who live after Christ? Or as just holier than thou as religion. Now he's Mr. Religious. Is that all they see you as? Or do they see you as someone who actually cares about them? Or is it, do they see you as not even knowing that you know Christ or claim to know Christ? Would anybody that you know and work with on a regular basis say, he's a Christian? I didn't know that. She's a Christian? I didn't know that. Is there really a transformation that others are seeing? Or is it just false and just some high-mindedness. Oh, I go to church and we do these nice things. Think about it. You have to. Because much is relying on this. Much is dependent upon your looking in the mirror of truth and seeing who you are. Someone once said, a false friendship like the ivy decays and ruins the walls it embraces, but true friendship gives life and animation to the object it supports. I'd like to give an example of my wife. You know, she's not been here for a while. She's uh, in the States doing school right now, but the, my wife loves me. It's hard for me to get, get choked up how much she loves me. She's transformed my life because of her love. I have put my faith and trust in her as a human being, as much as one can, not in, as in Christ, but as a human being, one toward another. She has changed my life. She has shown me through her love how strong I can be because of it. She is not like the vine that tears me down. She is, as the Bible says, like Christ in the marriage that he gives us. When he marries us, he has given me a perfect example of what to expect. Because she builds me up. She will not humiliate me. She will not embarrass me. She dreads the opportunity to embarrass me. She tries her hardest to build me up. In her love, she does everything she can to make me stronger, even at the cost of her own self. We as Christians should be showing this kind of love. It should be a desire to build others up. Our love for others should be what Christ did when he loved us and strengthened us. Not like the vine who tears away, but like the love of Christ who builds us up stronger than we ever were before. Something that cannot be crushed. Even when Job was crushed, he could not be crushed utterly. He could only be killed, and that was the flesh, and it meant nothing to him. Because he knew his, his, his life was in Christ. Love had strengthened him that much. Even as my wife strengthens me and shows me that, even in the flesh, how a man can live. How men should live after Christ. God is good and shows us the truth of his word. And displays in us the new life. And others will see this. That we will know according to the spirit. That our spirit bears witness with his. That we are in him and he is in us. He is a true friend that gives proof of his friendship, and he makes us new and gives life to what was dead. That is love. Love is transforming, and it should be completely new. You see, before our compassions were selfish and was for personal gain only. Before our love was one-sided and fed our lusts and our desires. Before our mind was filled with things of this world and not of the next. Before... Our works were selfish and greedy and envious as Cain was in the beginning. But now there should be a contrast to what others see transforming us. And we should feel desires that are new to us. And our lives will follow after those desires. Our compassion should be toward others, desiring our own, not desiring our own gain. Despising it, in fact. Our love should forgive all those around us and, des and desire their salvation. 
our mind should desire the wisdom and life and freedom in Christ. Our works should be fruit proof of salvation, putting our hands to the labor for the lost. You see, all things become new in our mind, our body, our soul. In everything we say, in everything we think, in everything we do, things begin to transform. All things become new because it starts from the inside. When the Spirit comes in, it transforms the life. He gives evidence. The newness of Christ in us, in Ephesians 4, 21 through 32. If so it be that ye have heard of him, that ye've heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning your former manner of living the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Now consider this, to put it off. It's still there. We have to put it off. We have to fight against it. We have to war against that flesh. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye may put on the new man, which is after God, is created in righteousness and true holiness. Therefore, put away, putting away lying, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down. Neither give. But rather. That he may have to give to him. out of your. But that which is. These are a call for us to do these things. When things change, all things change. And we need to change with those things. Our actions should be changing. We should see this as well as others will see this. This is one more thing that is new. And there is no struggle for a desire to do those things. Because the desire will be from the Spirit of God and not yours. You see, the only thing that we will truly struggle with is the fight with the old man in the flesh. Since it's not dead yet. We have to fight with it. But that fight itself will be a new struggle. Because you never had it before. You just went after it. Whatever it desired, we did. But now there's a new struggle in us. Accomplishments and good works don't erase our shame, hatred, cruelty, silence, ignorance, discrimination, low self-esteem, or immorality. It only covers it up with a creative version of pride. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ and his restitution, his forgiveness of your sins, his compassion, his giving you of repentance, and our living in his likeness will ever cast off the past. All things must become new, lest the old take quickly to the judgment. Only Jesus can cast and only true change uh, is real. There is a measure of that which is new. And it is valid and true. If we have it, we will grow in the fruit of the Spirit and in the works of Christ. If we do not, then we deceive ourselves and our lusts. And we are convinced by our own lies that we are good enough on the day of judgment. The real question is, not is there all things new in Christ, but are we in him and his, he in us? The evidence is overwhelming, and God calls uh, us to a new life that's very clear. Are all things new to you is the real question. Not, as a Christian, do all things become new. Because when Christ comes in, he will transform the heart, and thus all things from there will change. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord. I ask that you would humble us. I know it is hard to take anything we think about uh, as correction or instruction as easy or as willingly to take right now. But, Lord, humble us now today. Humble us as we go home. Have us to think, is our life new in you? Or are we just playing the same old game with a new face on it, calling ourselves Christian? Or do we grow up in a Christian home thinking we were Christian? Lord, I, 
I, I pray that you would give us the strength to see that truth as you did one day in my own living room when I wept bitterly to you for seeing my life of false, false Christendom and false things. Lord, I pray that people today will hear you and they will humble themselves and they will call out to you. Remember in Matthew 3.10, And now also the axe is laid under the tree, under the root of the tree. Therefore every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. We know we can trust him and that he is true. But if we see none of this to be true in our lives, if there's no true change in our lives when we came to Christ, then we must look hard in that mirror. Judge ourselves according to his law, the Ten Commandments. Our hearts are boast of our goodness, but the mirror of the Ten Commandments shows the truth according to God that we are evil in the sight of God and we are his enemies. Many of you lied or stolen. Think about it. The Bible says we're all liars. We're all thieves. We've all broken the Ten Commandments. If you guys need to come forward, come forward now. And if you need to pray, come pray at the altar. If you have any questions, come. If you want to join the church, please, please do so. But the greatest thing you can think of today is to consider, is there a truly a change in you? I'm thankful to God that he saw my sins and that he showed them to me and he helped me to repent. For he gave me the strength to humble myself and he'll do the same for you. Please come today. CJ to actually go ahead and head out to the foyer so you can speak a, a word of encouragement to him as he goes. So CJ, if you'll head that way. Did he already go? Okay. I see him in the back. Everybody see him. Wave your hand, CJ, so everybody knows who you are. Give CJ a word of encouragement as he's heading out after today. Let's uh, sing that song we sang at the beginning this morning, Jesus Firm Foundation. I can't remember how it goes. How firm, how founded. I can't remember. 
I'm sorry, I tell you what, let's do this instead. Let's sing, um, gosh, man, I can't remember that. What happened in the service today? I don't know. Let's, uh, let's do this. No doubt, huh? When we all get to heaven. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let's do that one more time. When we, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Great week, everybody. Remember, uh, Awanas resumes this evening. If you haven't started or you'd like to come, it's open to anybody who'd like to register tonight. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week.